Correct. Yeah. So what we're doing now is now we're getting the time value of money. And so instead of waiting to get those deductions, we're deducting them in the current year, giving us more cash flow in the current year than, I mean, it kind of sometimes becomes like the snowball effect. Again, because if you get something now, it generates cash flow. You take that cash flow, those losses, buy them into something else. And then, yeah, maybe 10 years from now, you're paying taxes because you've used up all your depreciation. You've used most all of it, but you've got much better cash flow that, you know, the taxes are not as big of an issue. So you kind of stack them together, timing income deduction, and also you're paying the tax whenever, whenever your tax bracket is lower or you created a scenario where tax bracket is lower. So you're paying the deduction, I mean, income tax level lower, plus you also timed it, right? Now, Correct. this is interesting. This is this is awesome. Now, let me go back to that chart that we have here. So hold on, what we add? Okay, this one. So let's see, which I'm just sharing my thoughts based on what I do understand. I, I know the couple, by the way. So um, numbers are fictitious, but it's there. What they have done next year is they took that one and they created an S-Corp. And then the S-Corp, they took a salary and they had a 401k match all the way. How would that benefit in terms of a maximizing your deduction or tax credit? When you get an S so, and you take a salary and you get a 401k set up. Yep. So what happens is when we convert them over to the S corporation and they start taking a salary, that begins to make them eligible again for the qualified business income deduction. The previous case, because their income it was below 350,000, they automatically qualified. And so what it is, some people call it the Trump tax cuts. Some call it qualified business income. At the end of the day, it's like a coupon, 20% off. So you can take 20% of your business profits and take them as a deduction. When on a married couple, as income starts going over 350 or singles over 175, they start to have qualifications on it. Hey, you need to take payroll in order to get these deductions. It doesn't matter who you pay. You can pay yourself. So you pay yourself the paycheck and then you're able now. So to get a double deduction because it's just a free it's a coupon you know and there's no tax ramifications much like if you all use a coupon you go to the store you go to the grocery store and you get you know five dollars off your groceries nobody's taxing you on that five dollars that's just you got a free five bucks but then now you take that on top of that you maybe take some of that you create the 401k say you create a roth 401k so you're not going to take a deduction for it. again forward thinking why would I want to put something in? I could get a deduction today and not, you know, or maybe not. Now, everybody's situation is different. For some, it works better than others. You know, we kind of craft them individually. But with a Roth 401k, now you put that money in, like we talked earlier about that 2.21 multiplier. So whatever you get in, you're now going to get 2.21, your original 100 back plus another 121 tax-free. Like free, 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 you know, and so when you're turned 59 and a half, you know, when you retire, but, but that's one of those now tax free, the tax bracket on tax free zero. So yes, you're paying tax today, but for zero in the future. Now, yes. I think it's just a, just a quick clarification, right? If you're do, doing any retirement plan, it's just deferred tax. If you do a Roth, you pay the tax now, but everything that you earn in that account is tax free until ever. Correct. Yeah. And so that's where sometimes and it's it's not always appropriate for everybody, but it is appropriate for certain people. And as long as they understand what they're getting into, again, this is where it kind of comes down to like more of a one to one relationship, kind of doing your tax planning. But and the reason I say sometimes, sometimes people say, well, I'm going to retire in a lower bracket. I, I hope so challenges. I looked at my crystal ball and said, hey, what's the tax rate in the year 2034? And it says, come back in the elections of 2023. Uh, you know, so I know what zero is. Zero is zero. You know, maybe we retire lower. I mean, it wasn't that long ago. Well, some of y'all on the call look really young. So, so us old dinosaurs, Ronald Reagan went crazy. He dropped the top tax bracket from 70% to 35%. So if y'all just think about stuff like back, you know, prior to the 80s, which was actually the 70% came from when JFK went really crazy. He dropped the top bracket from 
down to 70. And so a lot of people on this call probably can remember times like that when taxes were that high. And so it's not out of the realm that they start dialing the taxes up. So sometimes maybe you don't put all your money in there. You kind of couch it, do a little bit of both. Do, or you could do the pre-tax 401k. You could do pre-tax IRAs, things like that to start, again, taking some advantage of the time value of money. The important thing, what I'm saying here is everybody's slightly different. Let's look at your situation. But imagine you're just two W-2 people. You don't have self-employed business. You don't have anything else. And you start investing in real estate. You're like, well, why should I even do this? It's because you're now you're able to start deferring money. I mean, because when you retire, the truth is, it doesn't really matter what your rate of return is when you're in retirement. What matters is you don't want to run out of money. And so you want that cash flow. You want that consistent cash flow to keep coming in. And if you can get a lot of that cash flow without having the tax drag, because as you see, is the more you make, the more they take. But as you start getting some of this cash flow in the future from these new deals and you've deferred a lot of your taxes, you may not have to make as much. I mean, again, $7,000 with no tax is the same thing as $10,000 with 30% with tax. That's where you're kind of going. And again, defer, 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 die. Bill, said all the time. Let's, it's like let's a $7, clarify $7, the die too. Right. You get to pass it on to your heirs at a stepped up value. So so oh, I'm yeah. the oldest guy here probably. So it's a big part of my plan. Now, and now community property states like Texas, the spouse that inherits it, is getting unlimited infinity tax-free the step up so if two spouses own it in texas or other community property states and one spouse dies the surviving spouse is not inheriting any tax bill in non-community states they will receive half of it you know unless it's owned by one person or the other but if it's owned jointly half of it steps up if both people die or say it's a single person and they pass whoever inherits it like right now the first 12 and a half million is tax-free married the first 25 million now some of that's just also different tax planning again everybody's situation is slightly different but generally speaking those that take after you they're probably not going to be picking up a tax bill when you own it outside of your 401k outside of your ira Bill to kind of build up on that, right? Let's say on a W two, you, you don't have anything, and you got a couple of kids. At least from my side, we can hire our kids for a site. I mean, I mean, we live in a geek society. Everybody got something cooking, some way, shape, or form. If you can elosify that, establish that, you can always hire your kids. So I have two kids; they work for me. They really do, uh, and I make them work. Don't get me wrong. And then the way I take a look at it, I have a college fund, right? And versus them paying it. Going back to what Bill was talking about. If we pay them ten thousand dollars, right, or if it, it is same as paying them thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars, that's because I am saving the tax bracket money, right? So that itself is a return. Look at your college fund, how much to make five, six, seven percent of follow index. Oh, yeah, and it's if, expensive. Go ahead. If you're paying for college, college planning is retirement planning. I mean, it's cash flow. Now, the one thing you said, make sure everybody heard that they actually do work, you know. You know, just because they actually do work. I'm just saying, yes, they actually do work. They they report to me. They have roles to play, and and they they actually do work. So I'm not taking. I'm not saying take shortcuts. I'm saying do the right thing, make them work. It's a life lesson for them. But just imagine, it's a for for our business. It's an expense, and just because that's an expense, it's a right. It's a salary to them. There's a 30 35 percent gap. We're in this world, I'm gonna get a 30, 35% almost guaranteed return in the equity fund. There is nothing that I know of, right? Oh yeah. Because, okay. and then we so just because. Depending on like, again, if you're self-employed, now this goes back to like, say like in that couple before, you know, they were self-employed. Maybe they have two businesses, some self-employed, some S corporation. Cause okay. actually, so self-employed, no LLC, no corporation, no LP. And basically there's truly self-employed and their kids are under 17, the kids don't even pay Social Security or Medicare tax. And so now all of a sudden you're paying them income. The first 12,000 the kid earns is really tax-free anyway. So, yep. you know, get them to work, but then yep. say they put that money into some type of Roth. Now the kid's putting the money in a Roth or the kid's putting money, you know, you do something for college planning 
yeah. you're just totally setting yourself up for more benefits in the future. Again, sometimes you got to think three, five, 10 years ahead. But one thing I'd say about like, first thing I do in that, this is like my own personal experience. You can look around for investments and I'm not telling you which investment to do in, but it's one of those, you got to get off, you know, I'm a gonna, you know, kind of like five frogs are sitting on a log and three of them decide to jump. So how many are still left? Well, five, just because three decided to jump doesn't mean they actually did anything. So it, it's one of those, you, you have to actually do something. But in the event you get into these multiple investments, it's, it's very good in your first one and second one, or if you're about to sell one, cost segregation, depreciation becomes very important if you're about to sell. But if you've now built up a portfolio of losses, you have the flexibility of deciding, hey, you know what? This land deal has no depreciation, but it's going to make me some good money. I already got enough built up losses. I can go in and there. I don't have to do the one with depreciation. But then again, maybe you sold something at a large gain and you're like, you know what? I, I need a lot of depreciation because many of you have heard of like a 1031 exchange. That's kind of like where you, you give up one piece of real estate and you buy another, you don't pay tax. But something we see a lot of, it's called a lazy 1031. A lazy 1031 is I sold something at a gain, but I don't want to pay tax on it. But I'm now going to invest in this LLC and so I can't 1031 my money into it. So what do I do? Well, if you get into this new LLC and this LLC creates losses from a lot of the depreciation, the cost segregation, the bonus, if it all happens in the same calendar year, you can use the losses from your LLC investment. Like maybe you sell a bunch of your single family properties to get into this LLC. You can offset your gains with the losses that are generated from your Passive investment. Again, this is like when everything's passive, apples to apples. 100%. Bill, thank you. This is, I know we're top of the hour. I'll leave you with two two things, right? Underage kids, the biggest issue with underage kids is that though they cannot sign contracts, but we want our kids to invest and they, have, they may have to sign contracts on behalf of that. So if you stack up and if you got people like Bill who could say, hey, find a way to get your kids working for you, really working for you, like literally, and then give them a salary, they get them a Roth IRA, and then once you have a Roth IRA or IRA, two IRAs can buy together, same side of the table. All of a sudden, your kids, our kids, they can buy investment, they can own it via the Roth IRA because that's a custodial account, right? So point is sometimes it's how, sometimes it's who. In this case, who is the best way to go? So number six and seven, Please, you know, engage, especially number seven, find your, you know, who, talk to a tax professional, ask them deliberately the question, this is my income is, this is what I, I think I'll be finishing my, my year with, what the best thing I can do. On that note, your bias will matter. If I find the cheapest guy, all they do taxes, they'll give you that kind of an answer. If you go to a person who's doing real estate and other tax strategy and things like that, they'll give you that type of answer. So qualify your folks that you have, please. I love those CPAs and everybody else that do your taxes, but that fixed flat, I get to you two days before the tax. They're not the type of people you want to do. You want to ask your professional, do they do tax strategy? Have they done it before? Folks like Bill and find your you know, person, go engage with them. And the last one, I would say what I always got, because you've got to fit is this. Income versus taxable income. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>